activities for the last few days and that will continue through this Thursday. I'm Tim Reeves. I'm the deputy director. There's a lot of people to thank uh, to make all these events possible and they're named on uh, the banner uh, to my left, to your right, um, but especially the Eisenhower Foundation which was formed late during the Second World War to honor not only Ike um, but all the men and women who served, um, especially those from Kansas and in particular, those uh, from Abilene, Kansas. Um, so again, we appreciate all the support and, and simply could not do programs like this without, without your help. Well, today, tonight's special guest is Dr. Adrian Lewis from the University of Kansas, where he has recently, in the last month, became the David P. Pittaway, David B. Pittaway Professor of Military History at the University of Kansas. After a long Army career, Professor Lewis earned his Ph.D. at the University of Chicago in 1995. His dissertation became his first book, Omaha Beach, A Flawed Victory, published in 2001 by the UNC Press. And as I said last night, it is coincidentally and conveniently available in our gift shop tonight. And I know Dr. Lewis would be happy to inscribe a personal copy. And it is considered, Omaha Beach is still considered by most the best analysis of the Omaha Beach operation. Professor Lewis has researched and written extensively on war, national security, and military affairs, and we are honored he could join us today. And before I turn it over to Dr. Lewis, I will remind myself and all of us to please turn down our cell phones. We're being recorded tonight, and the program will be available um, in multiple venues over the coming months. So please welcome Dr. Adrian Lewis. Okay. Thank you. It's a, uh, am, I, am I operational? Can, I, can you hear me? Uh, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Uh, it's quite a turnout, uh, so uh, that's good. Can I, uh, <laughs> by the way, thank you for the introduction. I wish you'd leave the dates out, but uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it is. It's an honor to be here at the uh, Eisenhower Library. So uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Carl Rodell, uh, was one who was responsible for leading the effort to put the uh, Eisenhower Memorial in Washington, D.C. on the mall uh, there, which will be opening up uh, very soon. So he and I talk every once in a while. So uh, he's, uh, he's doing great work in terms of getting that, uh, getting that up and running, so great. Uh, let me uh, take a little bit of inventory here. How many uh, soldiers? A uh, few, a few, all right. No World War II veterans, one, yeah. World War II. Korean War? No. Good, sir, yeah. Vietnam? No. Okay, a few, a few, <laughs> few here. Uh, how about more recent operations, Iraq, Afghanistan? No? Okay. Well, thank you all for your service. And I, I, mean, I should have said soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines. I mean, when I say soldiers, I mean all those folks who serve in the armed forces of the United States. Yeah. So uh, thank you for your service. Uh, I'm a retired soldier myself. I uh, spent 20 years in the United States uh, Army, first as an enlisted guy and then later as, as, as an officer. I would like to be, uh, advance my introduction just a little bit more to tell you about the University of Kansas and what we do. Uh, there are about five or six universities in the country that specialize in military history. Uh, KU is one of those. We work closely with the U.S. Army Command General Staff College up at Fort Leavenworth. We also work with the School of Advanced Military Studies, and then we work with the uh, new uh, Army University Press also. So if you go to any of those places, you will find KU PhDs. So my PhDs, for example, uh, teach at uh, West Point. Uh, they teach at the uh, Air Force Academy. Uh, if you go down to Alabama at Air War University, uh, you will find KU PhDs uh, there. Uh, and then, as I said, School of Advanced Military Studies and the uh, Command General Staff College all have KU PhDs. So in military history, we are, we are very strong and we provide a percentage of the intellectual power for the United States uh, Army and for the United States Air Force. We don't get too many Marines and Navy. 
they don't really count that much anyway. But they, <laughs> but, uh, but 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 the uh, we do uh, we do uh, a lot. Uh, we uh, KU, the University of Kansas, does a lot with the armed forces of the United States up to today, right right now today. Uh, I just uh, finished a, a ceremony a few days ago where uh, we did a hooding ceremony for two new PhDs, uh, one uh, teaching at West Point and the other uh, uh, at the uh, Army University uh, Press, uh, pumping out great work there. So your university, University of Kansas, uh, does a lot for the, uh, for the armed forces there. So I, just, I like to uh, push us just a little bit. We also work, by the way, with the Rock Army, the Republic of Korea. Uh, I have two PhDs in the uh, Rock Army and currently one here right now. He'll get his PhD and then he will go back to, uh, he will go back to their West Point, uh, their military academy, and he will teach here. So the Rock Army sends PhDs to KU. They're here for five years. They get the PhD and then they go back there and, uh, and do good things for uh, the Republic of Korea. So uh, your university, the contributions of your university to the national defense of the United States. Uh, my topic here is, of course, is the Normandy invasion. I, uh, I wrote uh, uh, Omaha Beach, and the uh, question I usually get on this thing is, why a flawed uh, victory? We, we won, didn't we? Uh, we yes, we did. All right, but it was a very costly victory, and you have to ask yourself why we did it this way. So some of you who have studied uh, military operations, let's think about this thing for a minute. All right? uh, we're going to conduct an amphibious operation against a deliberate defense uh, that has been years in the making. Now, let's see. If I was the United States Marine Corps, how would I do this? I would pull up to that beach with battleships, cruisers, and destroyers, and then I would blow it away for two or three days, right? And then I would conduct the amphibious assault, right? If you take a look at Iwo Jima, right, when the Marine Corps went into Iwo Jima, what'd they do? Battleships, cruisers, destroyers, Days and days and days of bombardment against that deliberate defense, all right? Now, if you were the British, however, and you were thinking about amphibious operations and stuff, and you were thinking, how would we do this best? All right, we're going to be attacking a continent. We're not attacking an island. Let me think. What I would probably do is I think I want to go in at night. I want to go in under the cover of darkness. I want to go in under the cover of darkness because I can get some element of surprise in there, some element of tactical surprise, and I can also limit the effectiveness of enemy weapons because of darkness. And all, all of you recent soldiers, we don't have the night observation devices at that time that we do now. All right, you, you, can't, you can't shoot with the same accuracy that you could today at, at nighttime. So, so if, so if you're the British and you're thinking about this thing, what I want to do is I want to go in against a poorly prepared area, a poorly prepared defense. All right, I want to go in at night and I want to go in under the cover of darkness. All right? So I've got over here, U.S. Navy, Marine Corps doctrine for the conduct of amphibious operations. Over here, I got British doctrine for the conduct of amphibious operations. And then what do we do at Normandy? 0630 in the morning, daylight, sun's coming up, right? 30 minutes of preparation against a deliberate defense that's been years in the making. The Germans have poured concrete, they've got tank ditches, they've got all sorts of obstacles there. 30 minute bombardment, the assault takes place, and then we get Omaha Beach. That caused you, you start thinking, uh, who thought this up? Uh, why this, why, why, why this way? All right, and, and this, this was the question that I, uh, that I grappled with. And uh, many long years ago when I was teaching at the United States Military Academy at West Point, I used to take 20 cadets over to Normandy and we'd do these staff rides. And so we physically watched, walk the beaches there at, uh, at Normandy. We, Utah Beach, the British and the, and the Canadian Beach also, but primarily American, Omaha and Utah uh, uh, Beach. So one day I'm standing there with 20 cadets surrounding me on Omaha Beach here, and I'm trying to explain this to them. And, and, and they're asking these questions. Well, why didn't they do it this way? And why didn't they do it this way? And then I'm trying to explain to them. And, and if you were a soldier in the Big Red One, and you landed uh, at, uh, in North Africa in 1942, you went in at night, you went in under cover, cover of darkness, right? If you landed in Sicily in 1943, another amphibious assault conducted by the Big Red One, the 1st Infantry Division, which, which by the way, is your division, right? 
Port Riley, Kansas? Yeah, he <laughs> belongs to you. That's right. Uh, uh, the big red one landed uh, there at Gila, fought an intense battle at Sicily, but they did it at 3 o'clock in the morning, landing under cover of darkness, uh, limit the effectiveness of enemy uh, weapon systems, get some sort of level of surprise in this thing. And then, and then they get pulled out to conduct a Normandy invasion, and what do they do? A daylight assault. Soldiers of the Big Red One that had to do that assault thought they were crazy. They wondered why did they do it this way? They were asking uh, the question, and their guys ultimately had to pay the price uh, for the uh, for what takes place there. So that that was the question. I wanted to start off with. This is the question: Why did they do it uh, uh, this uh, this this way? Right? And that's this is where we're going to now go through go through the uh, uh, the invasion. Uh, Uh, anybody got any place they got to be? Uh, I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> uh, I, I got all night. I can be here. My, 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 my point to you is that uh, they, they, you know, when people tell me, yeah, we want you to give you a 30-minute lecture here and those things, and I say, yeah. I got a lot to explain in 30 minutes. I'll do my best, but if uh, it takes 15 more than that, you still with me? Okay, you good? <laughs> okay, 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 great. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, it's a big invasion. <laughs> it's, the large, it's the largest invasion in, uh, in history. This is Nazi-occupied uh, uh, Europe. All of Europe is under, uh, under uh, Nazi control at, uh, at, at this time. The Russians have been fighting uh, since Operation Barbarossa. Operation Barbarossa, the largest land invasion in history in, in uh, uh, June of 1941. It, it will take place. And so the Russians are, 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 in, the, uh, are in the war also now. This is the German chain of command. Uh, what I want to do is point out to a guy, a guy named Rommel, all right? General Rundstedt, who's commander of, he's the Eisenhower of the German part of this thing. He's the, he's the theater commander. Everybody, everything in that theater of war belongs to General Rundstedt, all right? Now, the place at Normandy and the place at the Pas de Calais, they have a guy named Rommel. Rommel is in charge of the fences there. So, a guy named Hitler, in December of 1943, asked Rommel to do an inspection of what they call the Western Wall. Right? Rommel went and did that inspection. He said it wasn't as strong as it should be. It wasn't the quality that he wanted to. And as a consequence, a guy named Hitler said to you, well, you, it's yours now. They put him in command of it, and Rommel then became responsible for the conduct of the defense uh, along the coast of Normandy and in the uh, area of the Pas de Calais. Now, there's some debate between General Rundstedt the theater commander, and Rommel, who's commanding the areas in which the uh, invasion will take place, and areas that they think the invasion will, will take place. So there's a debate going on within the German command about doctrine, right? About the plan for the conduct of, of the defense. It's being, it's being uh, uh, debated. There's a guy named Geyer here who's uh, important also. Panzer Group West, that's their strategic reserves. The strategic reserves. Right? Commander always likes to have strategic reserves, and that consists of about five, six armored divisions. These are heavy tank divisions. All right? And so when you think about the conduct of, of the defense, you recognize you can't be strong everywhere. What you want to do is say, where's the main attack going to take place, and then let the situation develop, figure out where the main attack is, and then you want to take your strategic reserves, those panzers, and then you want to attack that area. All right? When you got 2,000 miles of coast, you can't be strong everywhere. You need to figure out, try and figure out where the main attack is. Question is, which is the main attack? Is it a secondary attack? Is it a main attack? That's, that's part of your problem. And so the German intelligence people need to be trying to figure out where the invasion will take place. And that, so, so, so right now we're the Germans. We're looking at this thing from the German perspective and trying to analyze how we're going to defend the, uh, the, Western, uh, the Western Wall. Some of our characters there. The Germans spent a lot of time building concrete emplacements, uh, putting uh, artillery pieces in, digging tank dishes, ditches, uh, et cetera. But there's still some analysis that has to go into, uh, in, into this. Right? General Rundstedt had the idea that in terms of putting in the defense, what we need to do is we can't be strong everywhere. Right? What I want to do is put a thin wall along the coast. Right? And what that wall is supposed to do is to give me an early warning. It won't be able to stop the defense. It won't be able to stop a, a strong offensive operation. But it gives me early warning. Right? 
Once I get that warning, then I can take my strategic reserves and, and deploy them. Right? And if you think about the uh, German conduct of war in World War II, Blitzkrieg operational doctrine, right? fast moving panzer groups, not, not World War I trenches, those things. Think about the way that the fall of France, the way that that took place with fast moving uh, tank uh, formations. Right? That kind of thinking is what, is what they're talking about uh, uh, here. Right? There's another vision, though. All right? There's a guy named Rommel. Now, Rommel has a different belief. He believes that we have to win on D-Day. Some of you have, uh, they played the movie here, The Longest Day, uh, earlier. That, that, that term comes from Rommel. Right, that's Rommel's term, The Longest Day. And he believed that if they did not win the battle on day one, they would lose. Right? In other words, you had to win the battles for the beaches, okay? Now, let's think about how, how Rommel is, is viewing this thing. First, let's take a look at the big picture at, at this time, all right? Uh, Rommel will later be implicated in the plan to assassinate uh, uh, Hitler. But if we're thinking about Rommel at this point in time, uh, I've got the Russians coming in on, on, on one side. Uh, the chances of us having an out not victory, just a straight out victory for Germany at this time, doesn't look very good. H however, I have 60 divisions, all right? 60 divisions in Western Europe. So if I can defeat the Americans and British, all right? if I can defeat the Americans and British, I can then stabilize this sector. I can then use interior lines, take those 60 divisions, cross Germany, go over here to the Eastern Front, put those divisions in place, and then I can stop the Russians. Right? I can then stabilize this thing, and then we can possibly get a negotiated settlement to the conduct of World War II. Right? In other words, I can possibly still save Germany. I can possibly still save Germany here if we, if we do this. But before we do that, the first thing we have to do is stop the Americans and the British here uh, in, in this sector. And if we can do that, we can then move all those divisions to the other sector uh, here, and then we'll be able to fee face the, uh, the Russians. All right. So I want you to think about his thinking. He also fought the uh, Americans and British in, in North Africa. And he has a concern about General Ronstadt's plan. What he believes is that we should take these forces and move them closer to the beaches. He does not believe that if you have strategic reserves too far to the rear, that they will be able to get to the beaches. All right? And the reason he doesn't believe that is because of Allied air power. All right? The Americans and the British, by the time you get to 1944, can put 1,000 each. British can put 1,000 bombers in the air. The Americans put, put 1,000 bombers uh, in the air. And the uh, ability to then take those armor formations and get them all the way to the beaches there where they're going to be needed for that attack is what concerns him. So what he believes that you have to do is you have to take those formations, you have to spread them out along the coast and thicken the coastal defense. And then you have to win the battle on D-Day. Right? So what he needs is good intelligence figure out where the uh, attack's gonna uh, take place, and then he needs to be able to move his forces. He needs unity of command. He needs everything to be under his command so he can move those forces to that area. Now, the debate takes place, and what does Hitler decide? He compromises. He gives Rommel a little bit of what he wants, but he doesn't give him everything he wants. He doesn't give him unity of, of command. He still has the strategic reserves that can't be released without his without his, his approval. So he doesn't have unity of command. But he gives Rommel some of the things that he wants. And as a consequence of that, the plan that we thought we would fight in 1943, when the plan was put in place, is not the same in 1944, when the actual invasion takes place. All right? And that, that's key to this, because Eisenhower and Montgomery, I'm going to get to them in a minute, but they did not come up, they did not select Normandy. Right? There's a group called the Cossack Staff, right, under uh, General Morgan, a Lieutenant General, British Army, and then General Barker, United States Army. Uh, they are the guys who do the initial planning for the Normandy invasion, all right? They, do the, they select Normandy as the area. When Eisenhower is selected in December of 1943, when Montgomery is told he will command a 21st uh, Army group that gonna, will land at, uh, at, uh, on, on Normandy, right? Uh, the, select, the site of the selection has already been determined. They have no input uh, into, uh, into that aspect of it. And the plan that they put in place was based on the German defenses in 1943. Right? 
When Rommel takes over in 1943, six months later, the defenses are different, all right? So one of the things I want you to understand in terms of Omaha Beach and what happens uh, uh, there, what they thought they were gonna fight in 1943 and what they ended up fighting in 1944 were not the same thing, all right? Yeah. Altogether, the Germans have provided the best imitation of hell for an invading force that American troops had encountered anywhere. Even the Japanese defenses at Iwo Jima, Tarawa, and Peleliu are not to be compared with this. This is Samuel Elliott Morrison's uh, take on the, uh, on the Normandy invasion. Right? Uh, Samuel Elliott Morrison, the great naval historian, uh, these, are, these are his words about the defense that the Germans put in place on the Atlantic Wall in the, uh, in the, Normandy, uh, in the Normandy area. Let's look at the other side here. You should recognize that guy up there, right? Yeah, a guy named uh, Eisenhower. Eisenhower was the Supreme Allied Commander for the Normandy uh, in invasion, right? There was someone else who thought he was gonna get this job, right? <laughs> there was a guy named Churchill. And uh, Churchill told a guy named Allen Brook, his uh, chief of staff, uh, uh, chief of Imperial General Staff there, that he was going to lay, lead the, uh, the invasion. But he told him that in 1943, right? Now, what happens between 1943 and 1944 is, Priority shifts, and it shifts as a function of who's making the largest contributions. All right, so, so Americans enter the war, we enter World War II as the junior partner. But in 1943, 1944, transformation is taking place. And we're becoming the senior partners, and the British are becoming the junior partners. Right? So the landing isn't going to be commanded by the British, it's ultimately going to be commanded by the Americans. And when, 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 once we're uh, in there and you start thinking about the uh, Battle of the Bulge, for example, uh, there are 60 American divisions in there. There are 16 British divisions there. See why we're in command? 60 American divisions there, 16 British. Yeah, we're in charge. Uh, the, uh, uh, so as a consequence of that, Roosevelt makes the decision about who will command the invasion. There's, a, there's another guy that might have gotten the job, particularly if he had asked, and that's a guy named General Marshall. All right? He probably could have got the job if he asked for it. All right? But that guy named Admiral King went to uh, Roosevelt, uh, talked with him, and said that Marshall needs to stay in Washington. Marshall had been running the war throughout. Uh, he knew where everything was. He knew how things worked. And uh, Marshall uh, did not uh, get, get the job. Some, some believe that if Marshall had gone to Roosevelt and asked for it, he may have gotten the job. Uh, but uh, he, did not, uh, he did not do that. And Eisenhower is then selected to be the Supreme Allied Commander uh, for this. Uh, I do want, let me go back here for a minute. I want you to note that the uh, Montgomery, uh, the uh, head of the 21st Army Group, is responsible for, for uh, the uh, Neptune plan, the, uh, the tentative plan for the invasion. Right? So Eisenhower is the overall commander, but Montgomery is the ground force commander for the, for the in invasion. And the British got all the second level of command. So we got the senior spot, and then you have uh, for Air Force, Ramsey Montgomery and, uh, and Lee Mallory there. But uh, General Omar Bradley also is, uh, commands 1st U.S. Army. 1st U.S. Army will, take, will, will have two corps to it. It will be the 5th Corps and the 7th Corps. The uh, 7th Corps will land under uh, General J. Lawton Collins. Collins will ultimately be Chief of Staff during the Korean War. Uh, General J. Lawton Collins will command the 7th Corps that will land at Utah Beach. And uh, General Leonard T. Giroux will command the 5th Corps, which will land at, uh, at Omaha uh, Beach. And all of that's under uh, General Omar Bradley. Omar Bradley, uh, one of the five five-star generals uh, in, in, our, in our army, but he also has, during the Battle of the Balls, he will have the largest army command ever assembled. He will fight the largest battle ever fought by the United States uh, Army, and that's the Battle of the Bulge here during, uh, during World War II. You are to enter these, uh, we had something called the Combined Chiefs of Staff, which was the British uh, Imperial General Staff and the American Joint Chiefs of Staff. They form the Combined Chiefs of Staff, and they issue orders to operational field, uh, commanders in the field. And these were the orders that were issued to uh, Eisenhower. Once he was selected by Roosevelt, uh, you will enter the continent of Europe and in conjunction with the uh, United Nations uh, undertake operations aimed at the heart of Germany and the destruction of her armed forces. Very simple. All right. It's a, uh, a mission statement. All right. Your mission is the destruction of Nazi Germany. All right. 
destroy the Wehrmacht, destroy the German army, everything else will follow, right? Very simple, very simple. Actually, the instructions were about two pages long, but simple, two pages long, go, go over there and destroy uh, Nazis, boom, all right? Not hard, hard to do. Statement's pretty straightforward though, all right? The, uh, they had a couple of areas to select for. Now, this again, this goes back to the Cossack staff in terms of selection of the landing beaches. Where along this 2,000 mile coastline should we, uh, should we do this, all right? Uh, if, I, if I ask uh, uh, people this and say, what do you think? Right. Well, let's consider air power. How much time does air power have over the battlefield? That's one thought. Uh, another thought, uh, naval gunfire, all right? And you ask yourself, well, what's the shortest distance between two points, all right? All right? And you ask yourself, well, where the German defenses are, where are they strongest, all right? And then you ask yourself, well, we're gonna put uh, 100,000 soldiers over there, we need port facilities, so where's the nearest port at, all right? And then you ask yourself, well, we're gonna cross beaches here, tanks weigh 20 tons, uh, are they gonna sink in the sand? Uh, What's the beach pressure? What's the quality of the beach pressure, all right? So, so what you're seeing here is you develop a long list of criteria, right, for the conduct of the, of the landing here. You, need, you, the, the, you develop a list of these are the things that we need to conduct an amphibious assault here of the size that we're, of the size that we're, we're talking about, all right? And, and once, once they do that, they can narrow down the possible areas for the, uh, uh, for the landing, right? And one of the major areas that they're thinking about is the Pas de Calais uh, area. Right? And, and, the reason, and the reason for that, sh great beaches, shortest distance between two points, air power has enormous loiter time over the battlefield. All of those things come into play when, they are, when they're thinking about, the, about this. Ultimately though, they decide on the Normandy area. Normandy does not have the port facilities that they need, but they will develop some new, some new uh, gadgets here that they will call mulberries. And these will be artificial artificial harbors that they will ultimately take with them. And, and, uh, but one of the great things that Normandy has is at this time, it's poorly defended. See, what the Germans did, they looked at this thing too. They analyzed it and they said, ah, you know, I think the Pas de Calais area. I, I think what they'll probably do is come across there. And they put their 15th army up there, and it's their strongest army. So they put tanks and other things in that area, all right? And so as a consequence of that, when the Cossack staff looks at this thing and trying to analyze, again, 2,000 miles of coast, they're trying to analyze this thing, they come to the conclusion that Normandy is the best area for the conduct of, of the invasion. Now, they haven't figured it all out, but they do select this area prior to 1943 when Eisenhower and Montgomery are selected to command the, uh, the invasion. The original Cossack plan. Three divisions will land there at, uh, at uh, Normandy. Three divisions will, uh, will, will conduct the invasion. Uh, they thought about airborne divisions on both flanks of, of this. All right, but uh, once uh, Montgomery and Eisenhower come along, they change the, uh, they change the plan for the uh, in invasion, all right? And the final plan calls for five divisions to land. The Americans will put ashore the big red one at Omaha Beach and at Utah Beach, we will put together uh, the 4th Infantry Division there. The 5th Corps will go in at Omaha Beach. It will consist of the big red one first, the 29th Infantry Division, which is a blue, the blue and gray, it's a, the Virginia uh, Maryland National Guard Division, and it will be followed up by the 2nd Infantry uh, uh, Division, all right? At, uh, at Utah Beach, we'll put again the 4th Infantry Division, and then we'll put the 9th Infantry Division uh, in uh, at, uh, at, Utah, at Utah Beach, all right? This is the initial plan then for the uh, assault at, uh, they also add, the 82nd and the 101st uh, Airborne uh, Divisions into the, uh, into the mix. This is something General Marshall uh, insisted on. And then in the British sector, they will add the uh, 6th Airborne uh, Division. So what, what you can see then is the, the Airborne Divisions will flank the uh, invasion beaches, try and create confusion in, in there. I'll, I'll show you what else they do to isolate the battlefield, which is what they're trying to do. So when the assault takes place, the Germans are 
less able to reinforce. And that's what the uh, airborne units are, are doing, and also air interdiction. Now I'll, I'll come to the uh, air interdiction part of, uh, of this thing. Cast of characters, Omar Bradley's First <coughs> Army, J. Lawton Collins, Joan Durow, and then Joan Dempsey, uh, commanders of uh, the, uh, the British uh, uh, Second Army. They will all, these, are the these are the individuals that will lead the, uh, that will lead the uh, in invasion. A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. <laughs> it took, uh, when, you, when you think about it, a, uh, the Big Red One, 16,000 men in an infantry division. It's been plussed up to over 35,000, right? right? Each of the divisions that, that's landing there. So, so on D-Day, you know, you're putting over 150,000 men ashore uh, uh, here uh, on, on the Normandy uh, in, invasion, right? And then all the stuff that has to come with them as they, are, as they conduct uh, uh, this thing, right? That's a sight, huh? Rolling down the streets. Uh, I would, uh, yeah, I was going to do it later, later but, uh, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a lot of stuff. The, uh, when Eisenhower and, uh, when Eisenhower and uh, Montgomery uh, sit down and look at the invasion plan, they add the two more divisions. They then have to delay it. So the original plan was to attack in May, right? But because the, they expanded the invasion, they didn't have enough LSTs. They didn't have enough LCTs, landing craft. So what they had to do was to delay it a month, and then as that delay took place, they were able to get more landing craft from the United States. They took landing craft out of the Mediterranean. They took LSTs from other places there. So they have enough ships to actually conduct the, uh, to actually conduct <laughs> Uh, the uh, invasion. So uh, those are those church will or the destiny of two great empires seem to be tied to some damn thing called an LST and, and that's his frustration with trying to get the ships and all the landing craft that they needed to conduct the invasion the way that Eisenhower and Montgomery uh, wanted to have it uh, 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 conducted. And some of these other figures there are uh, the various types of uh, LSTs, uh, landing craft, the various types of uh, landing craft that they have. So it takes enormous uh, resources to uh, uh, to do this. <laughs> yeah, that's that famous LST. By the way, they used to make those right here in the Midwest. Make them here in the Midwest. Uh, they'd send them down the Mississippi and then send them over. And they they didn't even name them. They just put numbers on them. Right? <laughs> they were they were cranking them out so fast in World War II. Uh, forget naming these things. Right? Just stick a number on it, send it over there, and boom, it was operational here in a short period of uh, a short period of time. Yeah. We made a lot of them. It wasn't the best tank in World War II, though. Sherman, it was not. This is a thing called the mulberries, right? And they created these artificial harbors, the artificial ports. Uh, one was built at uh, uh, the uh, area of Omaha Beach, and then the other in the British uh, uh, sector. And these were supposed to be uh, a means of an artificial harbor, an artificial port, to offload all this equipment all the uh, tonnage that you uh, uh, that you uh, that you need for the invasion right this is a this is a british idea it's uh it's uh these are the uh, caissons that that they will do yeah you don't mind if i take this off to you uh, <laughs> a little warm in here the uh uh they built them they filled them full of water sunk them they pumped all the water back out of them once the invasion takes place they put it on a tugboat they tow it over to there right and then they, uh, they make them operational uh, here. Artificial port, boom. Uh, it, uh, that, that's, that's what this thing actually uh, was. They sunk ships to create a breakwater. Air power. There's a, uh, for the Normandy invasion, this is something Eisenhower insisted upon. So we can talk about the debates over the ground conduct of, of, of the war, but this, this, this belongs to Eisenhower. Eisenhower wanted something called the transportation plan, right? And what he wanted to happen was he wanted to isolate the battlefield. 
And so what he did was he, he told Carl Spotts, who commanded the uh, uh, U.S. Strategic Air Forces in Europe, and then he told Bomber Harris, who commanded the British uh, uh, Bomber Command, in, uh, that what I want you to do is to isolate the battlefield here at, at Normandy, right? And, and what I want you to do is to bomb railways, bridges, right? And what I want you to do is to create a corridor around Normandy. Now, you got to be sneaky about this, though, right? If you bomb it exclusively, they'll know that Normandy is the area. So you got to bomb a lot of other stuff also in terms of, uh, in terms, in terms of this, right? So uh, the transportation plan was debated. The uh, Army Air Force at this time, they said, no, nah, we don't want to do this thing. They want to continue the strategic bombing campaign. Bomber Harris said, no, I don't want to do this thing. There's a big debate and an argument that takes place. Uh, uh, Eisenhower sits down with General Marshall back in the United States. Uh, they get involved with this discussion, and uh, ultimately Eisenhower threatens them. If you don't do this, uh, and, uh, and finally they saw it his way. All right, and as a consequence, of this this actually does take place. One, one of the things that's poorly studied is how many Frenchmen we killed in uh, in, in, in World War II. Uh, we called it daylight precision bombing, but it was not precision. All right. We killed a lot of people, right? We, we killed a lot of Frenchmen in the process of, 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 doing, of, of doing this. How, however, what, what Eisenhower was trying to do, and I told you about those strategic reserves, right? What he's trying to do is to make sure those strategic reserves are not on Omaha Beach or Utah Beach 24 to 48 hours after the landing takes place. That, that's, why, that's, why he's, uh, that's why he's doing this. He believed this was one of the keys to success in the, uh, in the, in the invasion, right? And, and as a consequence of that, this, this, operation, uh, does take, uh, this operation does take place. Right. Eighth Air Force, right? Normandy down there at the, uh, at the bottom there, right? See the bombers coming out of uh, England. What do you think? Any thoughts? He missed. Yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah. But, but suppose I ask you to do this. You're a smart guy. So what you would do, see so yeah, that smart gentleman, what's your name, sir? I'm uh, Robert D. Yeah, Robert? See, Robert would have told those bombers. He would have called them way out here. And then he would have said, line up on the beaches right, and fly parallel to them. That's what you would have done, right, Robert? Okay. <laughs> now the Army asked the Army Air Force, you know, why, why don't you do this? Why don't you swing out here and, and fly parallel to, these, uh, to the beaches uh, uh, here? Uh, the Air Force had an argument, though, and says, you know, if you put a, a spotter, a German spotter here, all right, and then he tells their anti-aircraft guns there, then by the time we get there, all that anti-aircraft fire will be in, in the air, and we, and, and we will be uh, uh, interdicted, sort of, uh, in, in route to this thing. So the Air Force didn't want to, 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 want, didn't want to do that. H however, as a consequence of not doing that, they missed. They, they missed. Uh, that would have been a better way to, uh, uh, to do this. And we'll, we'll come back to this, but that's the, uh, that's the route that the Air Force will fly uh, out, of, uh, out of England. Technology's a little slow here. Uh, good stuff. Anybody ever jump out of the airplane with the Army? Ooh, uh, all right. 82nd? Second Ranger Battalion, sir. I was with Second Ranger Battalion. Huh? No? <laughs> yeah? Uh-oh. Coin? <laughs> oh, gotcha, huh? Beer's on you. <laughs> Beers on you. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This uh, mass tech. Uh, 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 my friend back there. Uh, we we've done this thing. Entire battalion jumping out. Cool stuff. Uh, but this is the 82nd and 101st. Uh, uh, at uh, that, that's them rehearsing. That's not actually the. It, it went in at night uh, on in a full moon uh, uh, here. Right. The uh, the selection of H hour. And this is where doctrine comes. In, into place. Should we go in under the cover of darkness? Should we go in in the hours of, of, of daylight? Uh, now, one of the things that influences the decision here is something that they didn't have in the Pacific. And it's something they did not have in North Africa and something they did not have in Sicily. And that something is air power. Uh, 
they did not have the air power that they have sitting there in England. Right? They did not have the U.S. Strategic Air Force, the 8th and 9th Air Force. And these are huge organizations in World War II. Right? Now, let's think about it. I've got to conduct the most important landing in history. I got all this air power sitting here. Am I not going to use it? Of course not. I have to use it, right? How much time do they need to use this thing? How much time do they need to do this thing? 20, 30 minutes. They can drop bombs right there on the beaches, destroy everything, boom. Right. Yeah. Sounds like a good idea. Sounds, sounds like a good idea. <laughs> OK. All right, but the air power, the timing of the air power influences the timing of the landing, right? It ultimately influences the decision on their things. Again, soldiers of the Big Red One, particularly those that had combat experience, those who landed in North Africa, those who landed in Sicily, right? Those guys, they want to go in and cover darkness. They want to go in. They know it's going to be a mess, but they know that effectiveness of enemy fire is greatly diminished at, at night, and as a consequence of that, that's the way they would prefer to, uh, that's the way they would prefer uh, to do it, right? The uh, sequence of, of, of events here in terms of the, uh, in terms of the land. Fifth Corps is under General Leonard T. Uh, Giroux. Uh, down here at the very bottom here, the 16th uh, uh, Regimental Combat Team belongs to the Big Red One. The 116th Regimental Combat Team belongs to the 29th, uh, 29th Infantry Division, which is a National Guard uh, uh, division, right? Uh, a few, uh, Right here in Kansas, you have the what? 35th, right? 35th National Guard Division, Kansas and Missouri National Guard Division. The, uh, if, you think about, if you think about those, those divisions, right, because they belong to the National Guard there, and they're nationalized for war, so let's say that uh, Abilene uh, has a, uh, an infantry regiment that's part of the 35th Infantry Division. And then let's say that, that that regiment goes in at some place called Omaha Beach. What happens to Abilene? Yeah, yeah. When you, when, you, when you take National Guard divisions as opposed to regular Army divisions, all right, regular Army units, all right, the problem that you have, the danger that you have, is that one small community can sacrifice enormously and that's what happens with the 29th, right? There's a huge monument in uh, Virginia uh, for the uh, soldiers that uh, landed at, uh, at Normandy because they pay an incredible price uh, for, uh, for this at, uh, at, at Normandy, 116th Regimental Combat Team. Uh, the uh, General Eubner uh, is overall in command. Big Red One is all overall in command of the uh, landing at, uh, at, Omaha, at Omaha Beach, right? Same uh, organization shows the 29th uh, Infantry Division uh, uh, in here. Right? This is the sequence of the uh, of landing. Right? DD tanks are supposed to land five minutes before H hour. Then H hour, uh, the uh, infantry comes in. Uh, the infantry lay down the base of fire. So I have tanks on the beach with the DD tanks. And then have my infantry come in. They lay down the base of fire. I then have my engineers come in behind them. The engineers are supposed to clear obstacles, minefields, and all those things. They're create, supposed to create 18, uh, 16 uh, tracks through the obstacles and minefields to get up to the, uh, the bluff. And then the rest of the infantry comes in uh, uh, behind them. That's, that's supposed to be the sequence of, uh, of, of events here. Right? This is something called a DD tank. I, uh, I did a program uh, uh, for uh, NOVA uh, a couple of years ago uh, called D-Day Sunken Secrets. And, and uh, uh, we uh, went down in these submarines along the coast of, of, of France here and saw some of these. these they're, they're just mounds right now. Uh, but they're still there under the, under the water uh, there. This thing is a canvas shroud. And it has the duplex drive tank. I'm not sure you can see it, but does this have a? No, it didn't have it. There are two propellers at the back of that thing. Yeah, at the, at the back of the tank, the two propellers there. That's a duplex drive tank. That's 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 what they call this this thing. All right, uh, capable of four knots in, in in water, but not not so good in high waves. They recognize that the wake of a strong ship 
uh, a large ship would uh, probably collapse to share out, uh, and, uh, and as a consequence of, of that, uh, we don't put much faith in them. However, we used them anyway. All right. Uh, uh, we, uh, we come up with this idea that this is a British design. We won't take credit for it. The, uh, <laughs> and uh, we, they come up with this design, and, and this is what we will use, these DD tanks to lead the way at, uh, at, at, at Normandy. All right. The beaches. All right. This is a side view. Now, how many of you sing Saving Private Ryan? Oh, most of you have? Good, all right. So that one, one of the things I talk about that, it was, it was well done. Steven Spielberg did a great job with it. But one, there are a couple of impressions that you get that just aren't accurate, all right? And one is the length of the beach, all right? It's, if you multiply about three times, you'll get closer to it, all right? It's from the from, uh, low point in, uh, in water to the, get to the bluff uh, is, is actually quite a, a, a distance. Right? The tight range is, uh, is, is enormous there. So what you saw in, in Saving Private Ryan is about a battalion-sized battle. So you, you need to multiply that. Omaha Beach is about six miles long. All right, and you got uh, two regimental combat teams landing abreast. So what you have there, again, is about a battalion-sized battle. Multiply that about six, seven times uh, there. The other problem that you get in Saving Private Ryan, it looks like about 20, 30 minutes, and they're up the bluff. No, this battle starts at 6, 0, 6, 30 in the morning, and it's going on for the, uh, uh, for the rest of the uh, uh, day. Uh, so think of it in, in, uh, in, in those terms, all right? No, oh, let's... let's uh, let me put you in, 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 in the battle here, right? Let's, let's say that you are, uh, you're a soldier with the uh, Big Red One, right? The, uh, the first uh, famed first infantry division right here in, uh, in, in Kansas, down the road here at Fort Riley. Uh, let's, let's say that you have uh, three types of soldiers in, in, this, uh, in this unit, right? You've got those soldiers that have seen combat. You have some experienced soldiers there. You've got guys that landed in, in North Africa. They landed in Sicily, all right? And they're saying, why me? Why a third time? Can't somebody else do this? Uh, when the Big Red One heard that they were doing this, they said, damn, <laughs> uh, you're kidding. Uh, that, that the 1st Infantry Division consists of hundreds and hundreds of replacements, all right? Uh, that there are other units that should be uh, uh, able to do these things. They were, they were not happy when they were first told that they, were had, they would have to conduct this thing. But, Omar Bradley asked for two divisions, two experienced divisions. And he got the bigger at one, the 1st Infantry Division, and then the 9th Infantry Division out of the Mediterranean theater. And he got them specifically for this, all right? But think about it, you know? There are 140 million Americans at this time, right? All right, you're gonna have 89 divisions in World War II, and you're gonna use the same one again and again and again, all right? So you can make an argument they had, they had reason for complaints uh, in, in this. In, in this regard, but the big red one will, will, uh, will get the job. So I have these soldiers who had a great deal of experience. All right, they've, land, they've done landings, they fought in Gila, they fought in, uh, in other significant battles, and they've survived. And then in their minds, yeah, will I survive this next one? Will, we survive, will, we, will I go on after, after this? All right. And then I have new soldiers, green soldiers. These guys haven't seen combat. Uh, uh, they're, they're wondering, uh, how will I do? Uh, some of them aren't worried about a thing. Uh, uh, they have no idea what they are, are going to, to, uh, to experience uh, uh, there, right? There are soldiers who have leaders, though, with, that have combat experience, and they will probably do okay, because that combat experience does, does matter. Eisenhower once said that one, ex one experience, one division that's been bloodied, one that's been in combat for a while, is, is better than three brand new green divisions, right? Because they don't know what they are yet. They haven't figured uh, out that. So that was the argument. That was the reason for pulling the Big Red One out of the Mediterranean theater and then moving them over to, uh, to Normandy, right? So it's the, 5th of, uh, it's the 5th of December, and Eisenhower's finally given the word that the operation is, uh, is, is going to take uh, uh, place, right? You're going to cross the channel uh, here in these uh, transport uh, ships, right? You're going to Two, two o'clock in the morning, you enter this park area where the ships will drop anchor there, and then they will commence landing op operation. All right, so, so you're in the 16th Regimental Combat uh, uh, team. Right? You, and, you and your buddies are getting ready to go over the side into a, a landing craft. Navy was pretty good to you that morning. They fed you bacon and eggs, right? Nice big breakfast uh, 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 there, right? Then the cargo net goes uh, uh, over, over there. Now, 
Waves are about six feet, okay? Six feet, all right? And, and you know, landing craft uh, ride on top of the water, ships ride in the water. So the landing craft are going up and down, so you gotta time it just right. So you go over the side there, you take your rock side, your weapon right, and as the wave comes up, right, you drop your stuff in, and hopefully you jump at the right time. If you jump at the wrong time, you could be crushed against the thing. If you drop it, the, if, if it's all the way down there, you got quite a fall uh, from you. So you have to time this thing just right. Not everyone does in, in, in this case. So a few people hit bottom and get knocked out uh, as, they, uh, as they hit the uh, bottom of those landing crafts, right? But once your boat is full, once your landing craft is full, you then uh, pull out from the ship and you start circling, all right? And then when an entire boat division is ready, then you hit in towards the shore in, in single file. Now, we're about 12 miles from the beaches, right? It's dark out there, right? Can't see a thing. 12 miles from the, uh, uh, 12 miles from, from the beaches, and, and you're in this little landing craft here, and you're hitting into uh, Omaha, Omaha Beach, all right? Waves are washing over. Guys have taken off their helmets, right? And they're trying to bail some of the water out. Some of the landing craft will ultimately uh, go uh, sink. Uh, but most of them, you know, they, they're able to get enough water out of there. Some soldiers are getting seasick. It's a uh, good old breakfast that the Navy started, uh, fed you this morning, those bacon and eggs, right? right they're, they're coming up now uh, from being seasick as you're, heading, uh, into, uh, as you're heading into the beaches right now. Uh, as you, as you as you go into the beaches, yeah, you're going to see a couple of things. Right? First, you see your DD tanks. You see people in the water. Right? And, and these were your DD tanks. So one battalion, 35 tanks. Right? They go into the water, 30 of them sink. Right? I always, I, I, okay, let, let, me, uh, let, me, let, me, let me make you a, 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 a tanker now. Let me say, so you're, you're on, a, you're on a, a landing craft. You're on a, LCT here has four, four uh, DD tanks on it. Okay. Let's say uh, let's say you're the fourth tanker. Okay. First tanker comes up, puts his canvas shroud up, right? He uh, rolls out there, and he immediately starts to sink. Waves are just too high. Okay. Second one comes up. His turn. He rolls off the ramp, right? Right into the water. Starts to move forward. Goes five feet and he starts to sink. <clears throat> You're in the third tank. What are you gonna do? <laughs> third time lock. Third time lock. It's all okay. You brave man over here. Third tank. Boom! Right down the ramp. Goes a few more feet in the water. And what happens? <laughs> starts to sink. That's right. The waves are just too high. The, the oceans are too rough there. Right fourth tank. What are you going to do? Right. Okay. Well, I'm getting closer. Okay. Let me see. How many are going? <laughs> okay. All right. You smart people here. Uh, uh, they went. They went. Fourth tank went off the ramp. And yeah, it started sinking too. 741st Tank Battalion. I, uh, many long years ago, I, I, I know they've. One of the things that happened with our World War II veterans, as you know, they, they're, they're passing very few of them up. But they, they used to have, uh, most of them will get out of these tanks. Uh, they had these things they called Mae West vests on, on and, and most of them will get out of, of it. Some of them will, will, will die with their tanks and, and go, but, but uh, a lot of those guys do, uh, do get out of there. But anyway, let me put you back in your landing craft now. So your, your landing craft is getting in towards shore, right? And, and, and there's your tank support. All right, gone. All right, the tanks support. All right, still you're hitting in towards the, uh, the the beaches there, and then and then and then you look back and you can see the uh, the uh, Arkansas and the Nevada and the 14 inch guns on those things, and they open up on the beaches. Right, gives you that warm fuzzy feeling. Everything's gonna be all right if you start hitting into the uh, into the beaches. Right, the uh, and, and as you continue uh, in, the, uh, the destroyers and others are opening up on, on the beaches also. And then they have these things called LCTRs. And these are landing craft tanks with rockets in them, hundreds of rockets in there. Right? And this puts on a fantastic show, right? And all of them, you see all these rockets, they arch up into the air, and you know all that stuff is headed towards the beach uh, also. Those, uh, those rockets, however, they were attached, physically attached to the uh, bottom of the landing craft. So if you're on a highway, 
I'm, or if you're on a low wave, see my problem? Yeah. But anyway, they look great, all right? You see them arch into the sky there, and they look great and you stop, right? So again, you're headed into the beach now. So you, you've seen your tank support there. You've seen the battleships and the cruisers and destroyers, right, all open up on this thing. You've seen the LCTRs open up on, on, uh, on, the, uh, on the beaches there. Then, then it's, uh, it's an overcast day, but it's an overcast day, but there's breaks in the sky, right? And as a consequence of that, you can see those B-17s, you can see those bombers, right? And you can see them flying in towards the, uh, uh, the beaches there, right? All that great air power uh, that, you, uh, uh, that, you, uh, that you have, right? And, and, and with all that firepower and all that uh, naval gunfire, uh, bombs, etc. Right? You got that warm, fuzzy feeling. Everything's going to be all right when we hit the uh, hit the beaches. Right? Then, as you get closer to the beaches, the sun's up now. Right? Daylight's broken. Right? And you get closer to the beaches, right? And then you start to notice something. All those obstacles, they're still there. All those gun placements, they're still there. There's no ready-made fighting position from bombs that were dropped on there. Right? The German defense is completely intact. And it's manned. And they are ready to kill Americans, right? At 0630, when that ramp comes down, that's exactly what they start doing. And the battle for Omaha Beach commences right there at 0630. And it is not a good day. When the day is over and the sun goes down, there will be 2,000 pure Americans. There will be 2,000 American casualties at a place called Omaha Beach uh, on, on, the, on the coast of, uh, of, of France. The uh, Big Red One in the 29th Infantry Division, they will uh, commence the, uh, uh, the battle uh, there. A lot of the leadership is killed. Uh, small unit leaders, sergeants, privates, right, they will take over. Uh, ad hoc teams will be formed because some of the landing craft were blown off course by the tides. Uh, uh, some beaches landed, uh, some of the land craft landed in beaches where they were not supposed to be. All right, so again, these ad hoc units will come into play. It's about noon. A guy named John Omar Bradley watching this thing says, we're, 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 we're probably not going to win here. We're not going to take Omaha Beach. Casualties are mounting up. We haven't gotten up this uh, uh, bluff uh, uh, yet. All right. This guy named Admiral John Leslie Hall. Admiral Hall earlier on told this guy, Scott, get in there. He's got 12 destroyers. He's got 12 destroyers, and he sends those things in there as close. They're scraping their bottoms on the, uh, on the uh, bottom of, of the ocean uh, uh, there, right? And those, and those uh, destroyers with those five-inch guns, they're now tanks. I, I, uh, when I wrote Omaha Beach, it says probably the first battle in history where uh, destroyers are taking place, uh, taking uh, part in a firefight that's going on between infantry and, uh, and an actual ground defense, right? Those destroyers will come in there with those five-inch guns, and they're sort of providing you with that tank support that you'll be needing to get back up the, uh, uh, the, the bluff there. If you take a look at the uh, ammunition expenditure by these destroyers that, uh, that Admiral Hall pushes up there towards uh, the beach, they will deplete just about their entire load here trying to help the uh, Big Red One at, uh, at, at Omaha. It's, it's a joint battle. It's, uh, it's the naval forces there, it's the Big Red One, it's the 29th Infantry Division there, fighting along this uh, uh, seven mile beach uh, and coastline here to finally get up the, uh, up the bluff there. The, uh, Initial penetrations don't take place where they thought they would. Right? There, there are road, there are cuts in that bluff right, where they thought they would be able to advance. Now, that's not where it will take place, but soldiers will work their way through minefields. They will work their way through these obstacles. Then they'll work their way up the bluff. And then they will move parallel along the top of the bluff there to destroy German installations uh, along, the, uh, along, the top of that, uh, along the top of that bluff. Right? Uh, when the sun goes down, we still own a little bit of a place called uh, Omaha, Omaha Beach. I, uh, I would take uh, uh, cadets uh, uh, there. One of the things we do, that we always did was is a uh, beautiful cemetery uh, with uh, 7,000 Americans in it. 
uh, that overlooks Omaha Beach. If you, if you have the opportunity to uh, to go to Normandy, I, uh, you you have to stop there. If you have that, if you have that opportunity, you absolutely have to uh, go there. I, I tell my students you can stand on American soil in France. Uh, uh, the French gave this land to the United States. Uh, and uh, interred there are, and it begins, it's, it's very well, it's very well done. It's a sacred site uh, where Americans uh, who made the ultimate sacrifice for their country are, uh, are, put, to, are put to rest. Uh, and then I didn't explain to my students that you could, you could go from here all the way into Germany, from American cemetery to cemetery, cemetery there. I, in World War II. Just, just, if you want to get in Germany, just go from one American cemetery to the next one to the next one there. Uh, and you can advance into uh, Germany uh, there from one cemetery to the next. We, uh, we, play, we pay a significant cost uh, for the liberation of, uh, of Europe. And, and I would argue, saving Western civilization uh, as a consequence uh, of, of that. Right? The, uh, Big red one, uh, the soldiers who uh, fought this battle, I, I think, uh, deserve uh, the lion's share of, of the credit. But uh, I, I would be remiss if I said the, uh, the US Navy, uh, particularly our Admiral Hall, who pushed those destroyers in, in there uh, on, on the beaches, also made a uh, significant difference there uh, in terms of helping the US Army out at, at a place called uh, uh, Omaha Beach. Right? Uh, some historians have uh, challenged my assessment of, of, of this. Uh, I make the argument we could have lost. Now, let me, let me, let me explain the, the uh, one, uh, one other thing here. Hitler had given priority to the Western. He took priority from the Eastern Front and gave it to the Western Front. So when, when we land at Omaha Beach, in Western Europe, there are 60 German divisions. Let's figure this out. Let's see, five are gonna conduct to saw Three airborne divisions, all right, eight, 60. Who wins? <laughs> if, if the Germans had known the location of the landing and had been able to, to move forces there, we lose. We could have lost. The other thing that I would say to you is we almost did lose at Omaha Beach, which means we could have lost at Utah Beach and Seward and Juneau also. All right? It was the men of the Big Red One who saved us there and all, but everything else. The air power, all those other parts of that plan fell apart uh, before, before we even got to the uh, uh, beaches there. So, so my argument, again, there are folks who uh, disagree with me, so I'll, I'll put that out there. Right? My argument is that we could have lost at, uh, at, at Normandy. It was possible uh, for us to be defeated uh, uh, there on the, on, the coast of, uh, on the coast of France. Right? Soldiers matter. Soldiers matter. Quality to character of soldiers that we put in the field matters. Right? Questions? Let me get I, got, I got on there, but uh, I beg your pardon? Let me get the mic. Oh, okay. How did I do it? Is there time? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You choose. Over here. Uh, all you do is holler at me. I'm good. All right, I'm choosing here. There's an iconic picture of Eisenhower speaking to the troops shortly before they. Right. And it's, it's always impressed me. In the back of his mind, how many of those young men did he know? Or, huh. Uh, he didn't know. Right, he, he, he didn't know, but I, I will tell you this, though, that the, uh, the reason these divisions were plussed up so much is that the casualties that we did receive were not as high as we expected. Uh, Utah Beach is, you know, almost a cake, <laughs> I don't want to call it a cake walk, but uh, it, it was a battle there, but uh, we didn't suffer nearly, so we had the best of time, we had the worst of time. Uh, they have the British uh, and, uh, and, and the Canadians uh, also. But if you take a look at what they expected and anticipated in terms of the casualties, right, they were significantly lower than the expectations of overall. But those airborne divisions, right, you had very high expectations that they would, they would suffer a high number of casualties. So they just said that. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. That's a great picture. 
That's a great picture, I mean, and, and, and in war you have to make decisions like that, and he, he obviously was able to do that. So we were in the gift shop one day uh -huh. talking about that iconic picture, and a boy came up and said, that is my uncle right there, and oh. he survived, and what they're talking about is fly fishing. We <laughs> 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 have the uniform, the uniforms here at our museum. Oh, fly fishing. So, wow. A number of years ago, he was in Avalanche, yeah. the band, he was in the and I met him then, and he was telling us about yeah. fly fishing. Right. Okay, let's go over here. Someone over here? No, just a side. Okay, you uh, talk about the operational decisions to make uh, Omaha success with everything becoming chaotic. Uh, you said that the Navy did a great deal for that, but what do you think about the Corps commander saying, we are not going to stop reinforcements, we're going to continue to land? and push people forward. In my mind, that was the key operational decision. Do you agree with that? There were others, too. But the Corps Commander, General Leonard T. Giroux at Omaha Beach, uh, but uh, the uh, actual amphibious assault is commanded by the Navy, right? The, uh, so, and so the uh, Admiral Hall made that decision also. So both of them in concert. Well, when, when, when I said that, Omar Bradley was reflecting. Omar Bradley, who commands the First U.S. Army, he's, 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 uh, he's saying these things, and, and he's been quoted many times uh, there. Uh, uh, we may not be successful here. We may have to go into another, another beach. But you're right. There's determined souls there, uh, Corps commanders, both Navy and, and Army, who said, no, we're, we're, we're going to make this work one way or another. Uh, but uh, in, in doing that, it, again, the cost was high. You're right. I have a question. Why didn't the Air Force come back in? That always bothered me. The, uh, Air Force. Air Force can be a mixed blessing, of course, but, uh, the, uh, the Air Force was used for interdiction. So, stuff coming in, in other words, they, we, uh, we were not capable, and, and I, I say this guardedly, because Marines in the Pacific were able to do this, and this is what we call close air support. So I got a guy on the ground with a radio who can talk to a guy in an airplane and say, destroy that over there, okay? All right, that capability existed in World War II. After that, you know, we have with precision weapons, we can do this all the time now. Special Forces guy on the ground, hit that target over there, boom, it goes right through the window. <laughs> that, that, that capability exists today. Uh, at Normandy, at Omaha Beach, it did not exist, right? We did not have, we had not developed the ability to work with the Air Force in terms of close air support, right? So the ability for some guy on the ground to say, he hit this guy. He couldn't even talk to him. He, he could talk to a guy on the ship who then would talk to a guy back in England who would then talk to another guy in the airplane. <laughs> it was, it was the, the capability for close air support, it just wasn't there. But having said that, the, the transportation plan conducted by the U.S. Air Force and then the interdiction operations were a success and they did contribute to the, to the, uh, to the invasion. So, so I don't want to. I won't get beat up by the Air Force here. <laughs> so, so they did make, uh, Air Force did make significant contributions to the outcome of, of the Normandy invasion. Yeah. Uh, you got one right. It's pretty well documented that Rommel wanted, what Rommel wanted to do was the right thing. Right. And uh, ultimately Hitler did not allow him to do what he wanted to do, right? And if he was able to do that, who knows how it would have turned out. My question is, how, how much was Eisenhower able to do on what he thought was best without FDR's interference of making decisions? If my question makes sense. Right. No, it absolutely does. And, and, and I think when, when I showed you the mission statements, that's, that's traditionally the way our armed forces force work. Uh, we don't tell you how to do it, we give you a mission statement, right? And usually it has an action verb in there. Uh, destroy, you know, take, uh, 
those sorts of things, right? And, and then we don't micromanage it. Uh, so that's, that's the way, that's the culture of our armed forces uh, there. And so Roosevelt did not. The British had a bigger problem because Churchill believed he was, uh, uh, yeah, he thought he was, but he also thought he should be down there in the mud too. Uh, at the tactical and operational. So Allen Brooks was always trying to restrain Churchill. Churchill wanted to go. Uh, uh, he wanted to be there at Normandy when the invasion was so I had to say, hey, you know, you run the country. You know? So, uh, so the British have a different problem than we have with Rose, Roosevelt. Eisenhower didn't have, uh, did not have that, that, that sort of problem. I, I, I also did not mention a, the, uh, the deception plan. Right? And Operation Fortitude was a deception plan that made the Germans think that we were going to attack in the area of the Calais. And, and as a consequence of, of that also, the German defense will fail. They will keep that 15th Army stuck there, believing that another assault will take place. I, 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 I have uh, been recently uh, conducting research in, for, for a book on uh, the German defenses there. And, and, I, and I think the biggest problem was with the concept we call interior lines. All right, so so let, me, let me give you an argument that if they had built, and they don't have to build it themselves, they could have had the French build it. If they had built an Interstate 70 all right, along the coast and to their strategic reserves, that would have given them superior mobility. That would have given them the ability to reinforce their separate units faster than we could have across the English Channel. All right? So the failure goes back further in terms of the construction of the German uh, defenses there. If they had had those road networks, uh, railway systems, high quality, they were able to uh, move forces back, uh, rapidly and to repair those things, then uh, it, it might have made a, a difference in the outcome of the uh, of the invasion, right? the other big failure is unity of command and, of course, intelligence. Right? They we were trying to figure out where the invasion is going to take place. All of those are also failures on, on their part. Gentlemen, uh, sir, uh, did the American leadership use METC to assess Omaha and the rest of Normandy, and what would that look like? Tell them what METC is. Mission enemy time train troops. Troops train, right? That's right. Yeah, that that, that, that he's he's talking about something that they they do a lot more now in terms of of uh, analyzing a uh, a uh, a particular mission. Right? right? Mission enemy troops train. Uh, that 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 uh, that analysis. Yes, yes. That that's not a uh, that that acronym. In other words. They used it even before then. Uh, they just didn't put it in those terms. But absolutely, uh, a lot of that's done before Eisenhower and and uh, Montgomery uh, take over, though. And, and the, the part of the unsung heroes, I think, of here in Normandy are, are Joan Morgan and Joan Barker, right, who do the initial planning. Because they select Normandy, and they do the analysis of 2,000 miles of coastline. They, they do it. They do an in-depth thing. I mean, the plans that they put together in terms of analyzing each section of the coastline there uh, to come up with the Normandy uh, uh, area is uh, is quite remarkable. So they, you know, Eisenhower and Montgomery get the lion's share, and of course they they, they should. But uh, we we sometimes don't recognize that uh, they inherited a lot when they but if they had got there in 1943 and they had to start from scratch, not, all right, it, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, December 1943, six months later, it would not have happened. Uh, the, the plans that John Barker and, and uh, John Morgan put in place make the difference in terms of the, in terms of the land. They, they deserve a great deal of credit for it, uh, but their names rarely get mentioned. Yes, sir. Who uh, was the who made the decision to send the American troops to Omaha Beach? And the person who made that decision on our group did they realize it was the strongest defendant? You're right, you're right. Why did British get Omaha Beach? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, uh, I, I, uh, I don't know if we can go back to this, but the, uh, see if I'm working here. But what we had planned to do was to reinforce from the United States directly. I, and, and so when you think about directly coming from the United States, I, it made more sense 
and these artificial harbors, we're going to have one in our sector, but let me see. Again, you see the artificial harbors here. But we were, so we stockpile a million men in England. But we don't want to go to England and then come to back into Europe. Right, so, so the plan is for, is for us to, if I can get back here, right. So the plan is for us to be able to reinforce right, from our sector. So we got this for logistical reasons. We got this sector of the beach so that, so that the British would have this sector right, closer to, to Britain and, and their resources. But we didn't want to have to go into Plymouth or Portsmouth and then come across the English Channel. So the idea was then that we would reinforce our sector directly from the United States into, into the continent of, of Europe. And that's why we ended up with that part of the, uh, that's why we ended up with that part of, of, of the beach. But, uh, but you're right, we probably should give it to the British, right? <laughs> um, at Omaha, had the worst happened, and we didn't win at Omaha, and was victorious at the other beaches, I have an idea of how that changes the scenario. Could we right. several, at least through the next several days or weeks. So, yeah. so, so how many beaches do you have to lose yeah. to lose the campaign, right, to be failed uh, there? And one of the reasons that Eisenhower and Montgomery both insisted that you broaden this, right, one of, the, one of their arguments, right, that we need more forces, more divisions landing on a broader front, right, was that very reason? Because you could lose one then. And if you take a look at North Africa, you take a look at Sicily, right? The landings took place over a broad front. Multiple divisions will go in, right? So what they were doing is simply repeating what they had done in the Mediterranean. And, and by doing that, they recognized that if I fail on one beach, if I lose on one beach, then, then we can steal, the landing might steal. Now, if I lose on two beaches, then, <laughs> And my chances of success uh, uh, diminish significantly. Uh, uh, but still, the idea exactly is, is as you say here. If I lose on one beach, we can still be successful in, in the invasion if we have multiple landings uh, on a broad front. And, and that's why they insisted, both Eisenhower and Montgomery insisted, that three divisions was not enough <clears throat> on the narrow front. We need to broaden this thing. So they, uh, they, they expand both. Uh, to the east and to the west here to uh, to add more more area and to add more divisions to it. And that's exactly the reason why. Yeah. Uh, gentleman over there. What would you consider President Eisenhower's most important contribution? General Eisenhower or President Eisenhower? Well, President Eisenhower. I beg your pardon? At the time, he was General Eisenhower. Yeah, but he also took us through the Cold War. <laughs> so, well, my question is, right for this operation, right. what do you yeah. consider his most important contribution? His, uh, ah, most important contribution. He, uh, he made a number of significant decisions. Uh, the timing of the, uh, of the assault, uh, getting the resources uh, for this uh, assault, uh, getting the 82nd and 101st in, in this thing, getting the air power, and that he that he needed uh, uh, one just one. <laughs> uh, 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 you could say he was good at building coalitions. Yeah, yeah uh, that's, that many uh, many give him many give him uh, a great deal of credit for uh, maintaining the alliance. Uh, uh, maintaining the alliance, uh, I, I don't think it would have fallen apart. Even, but but uh, with common interests and, and, and those things, that I think uh, are there. I I, uh, I I think I just say overall leadership in, in that. I I give uh, Eisenhower a great deal of credit for personal uh, leadership, operational, and strategic leadership, uh, and and selection of good people. Right? He. Uh, he promoted and he selected uh, really outstanding leaders uh, to, to the various uh, positions. 
He hung on to a guy named Patton when a lot of people think he should. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, I think probably I, I'd say his, uh, his leadership, uh, uh, in, in many ways, uh, uh, his leadership, operational leadership, strategic leadership, uh, selection of subordinate uh, uh, leaderships, planning. Uh, uh, I, I, I was a strategic thinker. And I think he demonstrated that years later uh, during the Cold War, also as president, uh, uh, as president Eisenhower. You had mentioned General Patton, and I had heard at one point he wanted to stay and go into Russia mm -hmm. and make advances that way, and there were decisions not to do that. And what was the, what was the context of all that? Uh, Russia's our ally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you, may, uh, you may think uh, that he's anticipating the Cold War. Uh, uh, but we weren't there yet. We, we weren't there at the, at the Cold War yet. And, and uh, at that time, it would have been a bad decision. Uh, you know, we will, we will form 89 divisions. The Russians will have over 400 divisions. Uh, the Russians are completely, you know, when, when, we, when we put together a victory plan, they said we could take, the population of the United States was about 140, uh, 140 million right? We said we could take 10% of the population, and we could create 215 divisions, and they could go fight the war. Right? And that way, American productivity would not decline. We still have enough people to run our industry, uh, tanks, airplanes, and things like that. Now, of course, they'll bring women into the workforce, and, and, and uh, they will provide that 24-hour, seven-day, everything, everything running. Uh, I like that. Uh, but we never get to 215 divisions. We, we only we only develop uh, 89 divisions when the uh, when the war is uh, over with. Well, actually, 90 divisions. One of them never deploys. So 89 divisions uh, will deploy, and then you have uh, five marine uh, uh, divisions also, uh, and they're primarily in the, in the Pacific. Uh, so when you think about the Russians, uh, when you think about the Russians and their population at the time, about the same size as ours. Uh, but uh, over 400 divisions. But remember, Operation Barbarossa, the land is the largest land invasion uh, in history, uh, and they've been fighting for years on, on that front. So they have a very experienced, very capable army. T-34, one of the best tanks of the war. Russians, yeah, Russians are good <laughs> at this at this point in time. They're really angry. Yeah, yeah, they are. <laughs> they have good reason to be angry. They, they, uh, the, 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 the Germans were brutal in Russia. I mean, that, that was extermination warfare, what the Germans were doing in Russia. Uh, yeah, really horrendous stuff. Did I do it all? Thank you very much. No. Thank you.